All right, everybody. Eight o'clock. Welcome back to your favorite class. Bright and early, bushy tailed, all those things. Uh, Got to make sure to tell you homework one will be due. Tell all five of you that homework one is going to be due on Monday. So make sure you get that in. Uh, heavy dose of MATLAB. So MATLAB are designed to do what uh, we're doing in this class, which is matrix math. So um, make sure you take a look at that and give that a go. Uh, I'll be around for office hours after this class if people have questions. OK, uh, so I just want to pick up uh, where we left off. I'll do a, a quick little review and we'll just get going right away today. OK, so we're in the midst of talking about laminate engineering properties. So here we'll just review from last time. OK, so we are looking at limited engineering properties, and that is using some mathematics to describe what would typically be what we consider a normal engineering constant, something like the elastic modulus or the Poisson's ratio for our particular limit. So we'd like. to write engineering constants for our laminate. So if we had some laminate that looked like this, and we had some coordinate system coming out of this guy, which was like x, y z we are loading this thing with a variety of loads here's like an x here's an y uh, we might have your ns coming across the face these are our applied loads we could also have similar looking moments so if you had a laminate like this you might be interested in like what is the modulus in this direction what is let's say the elastic modulus in x or what is, let's say, the elastic modulus in Y, or what is the Poisson's ratio in nu xy, or so on and so forth. Okay, so that's kind of where we were going with our discussion last time. We had kind of like this three-step strategy. One was to define the strains of the laminates, one was to define the stresses of the laminates, and then relating those together to determine our engineering constants. Okay, so the strategy. would be determine relationship between applied loads and strains. Next was to determine the relationship between applied loads and stresses. And then use these strains and stresses that we developed to define these constants. These laminate properties. Boy, my handwriting not so good today. Too much coffee. All right, so that's the general idea. We had more or less made our way through this guy. We were making our way through this guy, and we'll talk about this last guy here today. Right. So quickly. We had relationship between loads and strains, and this is both strains and curvatures. <clears throat> and this one was pretty straightforward, and that we know. more or less the relationship between um, 
the applied loads that we have, uh, N and M, and the stiffness matrix that we sort of defined in last lecture, which is A, B, B, D, relating to the strains. So we just kind of want to flip this on its head to solve for the strains. So if we do that, the midplane strains and the curvatures will be the inversion of the ABVD matrix. So A, B, B, D. Remember, this is a six by six, where each one of those is three by three inverse multiplied by the applied loads N and the moments M. All right, so this was generally our relationship that uh, gave us the strain given the applied loads. And we said that this particular matrix here is the laminate compliance matrix. And it is often written using lowercase letters. Often seen as the following, where we have these ABBD matrices inverted equals this lowercase a, b, c, d matrix. Where again, the B matrix and the C matrix comprised in this six by six, not necessarily equal to each other, All right? Not necessarily equal. Uh, they could be equal given some certain situations, um, but not necessarily are they equal. I'll say usually. All right, so this is how we related the loads that we applied to the structure to the strains. Next step was relating loads that we applied to the stress uh, to kind of come up with what would be like an average stress for our laminate. Okay, so loads related to stresses. And here we kind of had a problem, and that's because where we have this laminate stack, if we're putting loads on the structure, then each one of the different layers inside of the stack is going to have a different stress, and that's because they have generally different stiffnesses if they're aligned at different orientations. Okay, so we run into a little bit of a problem here. And so the way that we counteract this is we enact kind of an average stress over the uh, thickness of the laminate. So I'm going to bring this picture back in here, which I kind of showed last time. Uh, and we'll sort of like talk through it again. And we'll say generally that the problem here is that each layer has a different stress response. Just like us as humans. We each all have a different stress response. All right. So need to average them together. So what I mean by they each have a different stress response is we know that we have some picture like this. Uh, where's my little pointer? Enlarge this a little bit, try my best. This thing is not like so cooperative for like putting it wherever you want. All right. So we see here that if we have some strain variation through the laminate from let's say uniaxial strain and some applied bending, for instance, some curvature, then because each particular layer has a different modulus, we know that the stress response for each one of the individual layers is going to be different, right? So depending on the stiffness of each particular layer, uh, each one of these stresses has a different response and can have different magnitudes because of the, 
the stiffnesses of the individual layers. So we want to come up with what would be this average value, right? Which is going to be an average of the function through the thickness of the piece, which we're going to sort of like leverage the mean value theorem here. So the average value of the stress in X is equal to, uh, we're going to normalize by the thickness of the laminate, where remember this is the dimension H, and we're integrating from negative H on 2 to H on 2. The actual stress function itself, which is different within each layer, which we said is sigma X dz. All right, so this is sort of like the average or the mean stress of all of the stresses that are in each one of the individual layers. All right. So from previous, we knew we know by equilibrium that all of the stress on the lambda itself must be equal to the loads that we apply. All right, so we saw before that the loads that we apply, let's say, let's just look at the x direction for now, and x from equilibrium was this negative h on 2 to h on 2 of sigma x dz. So that told us then that the relationship between this average stress and the loads that we apply on the structure is simply going to be, and I'll write it in vector form here for all the directions, here we have the x direction, the y direction, and the shear on the laminate. These average stresses are going to be equal to the loads that we applied, simply normalized by this extra value 1 on h. All right, so that was a nice finding. Um, I want to maybe just like draw this really quick so that we sort of like understand maybe what's happening. So if I look at uh, a laminate here, are they getting better? That one looks pretty trapezoidal to me. I don't know. That one's maybe not so good. All right. So remember here that like if we apply loads on this face, we typically will denote it with like NX. But really what this is, this NX is a series of forces that are acting on this face, which we normalize by the actual length of this guy in this direction, right? This LY dimension. All right. So NX itself is... what would sort of be like the force in the X normalized by the direction LY, right? And also, the thickness of this piece is the thickness H, okay? So if we wanted to come up with like an average stress, it might sort of be a good idea to do something like, okay, well, FX is going to be equal to what would be like the normalized stress times the area, so here that might be like the normalized stress times what would be the area here, Ly times H. So if we sort of like reorganize this for sigma X, it would be something like sigma X is equal to Fx on Ly times H, which is just N on H, or more specifically, Nx on H. All right, so we're basically just saying that the average stress on the laminate is the forces that we apply on that laminate divided by the cross-sectional area of that particular laminate, okay? So there's a lot of math to just basically say that the analogy here is sigma x is more or less the force that you apply in x divided by the cross-sectional area coming off of the x direction. That's more or less what it is. All right. So this is about where we left off last time. <clears throat> All right. So I want to pick it up here. Uh, and much like we had a relationship between 
the stresses and the applied loads here. It's your relationship between stress and applied loads or mean stress and applied loads. We can also come up with a relationship between the mean stress and the applied moments. Okay, and there's sort of a very similar derivation here, except there's kind of like an extra thickness term floating around, like an extra Z term. Okay. Um, so let me uh, right. So need a relationship between mean stress and applied moments. Uh, let's actually come back to this. For now, let's actually just explore what happens with the loads. Because we can actually learn a lot of information just from that. Okay. So now, now let's relate the stresses and strains to get engineering properties. You guys see my dog hanging out back there today? He's on the bed. I don't know if you can see him. It's Rocky. He's got like bloodshot eyes. He was at daycare yesterday, so he's like really tired. It's the best, the best Rocky. All right. So let's relate stresses and strains to get these engineering properties. And let's recall what the relationship is between uh, strains and applied loads for a symmetric laminate. So remember that we have this general relationship uh, that our applied loads are equal to this ABBD matrix. multiplied by the strains and the curvatures. But if symmetric, then this B matrix is equal to zero. So this guy goes to zero, this guy goes to zero. And actually what we're left with is a relationship between N and M that sort of decouples this entire thing. So that leaves us with N M equal to A zero zero D epsilon zero kappa. All right. So we've decoupled now and that our relationships are just N is equal to this A times the strains. So again, the only relationship that exists here is between the load that we apply and the strain in that direction. So what you would normally think of for like most materials. And also we've decoupled now to have D times what would be the resulting curvatures. Okay. So meaning now that we only have a relationship between the bending moments that we apply and the curvatures that are created, which is common for most materials. All right. So we've decoupled this guy. We can also invert this and look at what happens. And when you invert this, those decouplings stay put. Right? So if you invert, you'll end up with epsilon zero and kappa equal to the little a matrix, zero, zero, little d matrix, multiplied by applied loads and moments. Okay, so this decoupling allows decoupling between sort of these moments and applied loads, or we can just write, and I'll do it in long form. The relationship between the midplane strains, which is B epsilon X zero, epsilon Y zero, and K 
gamma x y not. All right, so these are the strains at the midplane of the laminate equal to just A times N. So this is like A11, A12, A16, A12, A22, A26, 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 and A66. Again, this guy is symmetric. That's why I'm writing them as in this particular format. Multiplied by the applied loads NX, NY, and NS. All right. So we have this sort of look for a symmetric laminate. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to run our little experiment. OK, and we're going to say that let's only apply load in the X direction so that we only create a stress in the X direction. And let's see how the strains respond. Once we understand that, we can relate the stress that we applied, the sigma x, to the strain response, which would be epsilon x, epsilon y, and epsilon s. All right. So we're going to run what would be like a mock experiment. Where we only run. what would be sort of a, a uniaxial average stress in the x direction. And we know that we have the label for that, which is sigma x with the bar on top of it. All right. If that's the case, then this load vector can be rewritten in terms of those applied stresses. OK, so then we have what would be again, this full blown compliance matrix the compliance A matrix. Multiplied by, now here we're going to substitute in the relationship between the applied loads N and the mean stresses that we discussed before. So after substituting in, we will simply have H sigma X zero and zero. So this is if we just apply sort of a uniaxial mean stress, now relating our strains to what would be sort of our loads. But here we're writing the loads in terms of the mean stress that we apply. All right. So when you execute this, you'll end up with the strains equal to, if we just do our traditional matrix math, it'll be something like H sigma X A11 multiplied by H sigma X A12 multiplied by H sigma X A16. All right. So this gives us a relationship between the strains and the stresses, sort of through the averaging, like the mean stress, those sorts of things. All right. So now, since we have some like relationships here, we can probably start to sort of like derive our laminate uh, engineering properties. All right. So So let's define an effective laminate modulus. Stalling is hard. effective laminate modulus which is e bar x sort of this mean elastic modulus in the x direction all right and we'll say that this mean elastic modulus or this effective modulus is the mean stress divided by the strain so here this is our mean stress sigma x divided by the resulting 
uh, mid-plane strain in X, right? So for us here, that is this sigma bar X, which is something we're going to keep over the epsilon X naught, which we have, oh boy, which we have now in terms of things that we know, all right? So here, this is H sigma bar X, A11. So we can obviously get rid of our applied mean stress and say that the effective laminate stiffness is only going to be a function of the thickness of the laminate H and the compliance matrix entry A11. Bam! So this will be one on H A11. So here's an expression for your effective laminate modulus in the x direction. It is 1 on h times the a11 entry, where a11 is the laminate compliance entry 1, 1. Right? <clears throat> we can do something similar for what is the um, effective Poisson's ratio. And that is the new XY is a relationship between longitudinal and transverse strain. So here we have negative epsilon Y zero, sort of this transverse strain divided by the longitudinal strain, which would be epsilon X zero. So if we plug in here, uh, and we'll have something like uh, epsilon y0 uh, will be this entry here. And epsilon x0 is this entry here. So we can straight away cancel like the h sigma x. And this will be just left with as like negative a11 on a. Oh, sorry, I got that backwards. Negative a12 on a11 or if you sort of like rearrange this guy and bring it down <clears throat> you could come up with some alternate expression for new xy that contains not just a11 and a12 but maybe contains the variable ex all right uh, and i forgot that we need our effective um, poisson's ratio new xy all right so uh you could rearrange and sort of plug in for uh what would be like the um, longitudinal modulus there, uh, E bar X. Uh, but this is kind of like the general idea that we can sort of write these relationships in terms of entries of the A matrix that we can calculate by inverting the typical laminate stiffness matrix. We'll do one more here, and then I'll uh, kind of gloss over the rest, all right? We have an effective laminate X S shear coupling coefficient. So we talked about this in 429, but it's this idea that if I pull on the laminate in the X direction, it might shear in the plane, which is sort of a very strange sort of idea. And so there's this coefficient that helps us define how much pulling this way requires, you know, will give us shear in this kind of like shearing direction, right? So this effective laminate X S shear coupling coefficient, we usually give with this uh, variable eta here XS, which is a relationship between the shear that is developed and the strain that we have in the X direction. Okay, so again, if we sort of plug in and simplify things, we get a relationship between the A matrix entries and the shear coupling coefficient, eta XS. So here, eta XS. Written in terms of the A entries is A16 on A11. All right. So this was carried out 
with only a mean stress in the x direction. Okay, so for applied mean stress in x direction, which is this sigma bar x, we get what would be the effective laminate modulus Ex, the effective laminate Poisson's ratio, nu xy, and the effective laminate shear coupling coefficient, which is eta xs, uh, there. And this is all in terms of what would be the A matrix. All right. We could run similar experiments for the y direction and the s direction. And that would be like applying this mean stress in the y direction alone. Or what would be to apply uh, shear stress alone. All right, we'd go through the same exercise, right? We'd plug in what the loads would be given those particular stresses, determine then the resulting strains and make a relationship between the stress that we applied and the strains that develop to determine these laminate engineering constants, okay? So uh, I'm going to sort of refer you to the notes. Uh, and specifically, these are slides uh, here we have six and seven uh, in lecture two. So I'm going to pull those up here really quickly so we can take a look at them. Uh, it seems kind of silly to sort of like write them all down, right? Any, we have a question in here? Oh, nope, just the meeting starting. Okay, so here we have these laminate engineering problems I was discussing. So here's the relationship between the strains, the compliance matrix A, and the applied loads N. And this is like our mock experiment that's happening where we've simply plugged in H sigma X for the applied load N. And so this is sort of me kind of describing the resulting um, laminate uh, engineering properties that develop, okay? One other thing that you'll note is that you can rearrange these. Let's say you could rearrange this guy for A11 and see that A11 can be written in terms of the laminate engineering property EX. You can do a similar thing with A12 and a similar thing with A16, writing them in terms of these engineering properties that we've developed, all right? So that was doing an experiment where we just applied load or just put a mean stress in the x direction. We can do similar things where we apply just a mean stress in what would be the y direction and certain things fall out. And those are generally these relationships here on the right hand side. And we can similarly apply what would be like this pure shear and get similar results. Okay, so I'm not going to belabor this. I'm not going to write it all on my white pad. Uh, I just want to sort of like point out what the general strategy is and that you're really kind of performing these mock experiments to sort of flush out these various relationships between the A matrix, which you can calculate given your laminate conditions, and the engineering properties, which you might be more accustomed to working with, things like Poisson's ratio, modulus, so on and so forth, okay? Um, so now what we will see is that we can write our laminate compliance matrix entries like A11, A12, so on and so forth, in terms of these engineering properties that we've just discussed. So if you want to rearrange what would be the relationship between strain and applied loads, you can do that by writing them in terms of the laminate engineering properties, and this is what that relationship looks like. 
So here, what I'm trying to show is this is like the strain is equal to the little a matrix times the applied mean stress, right? So this is here a relationship between the strains that develop and the loads that we apply through the laminate engineering properties. Okay, so this here is page eight on your notes. All right, I'm going to have to accelerate this a little bit, and I'm actually going to go through an example problem at the end of the slides here, kind of like showing some MATLAB code for how you might attack a problem where you have to define these laminate engineering properties. So I've kind of switched to the PowerPoint here, and I'm going to show an example, and we're going to walk through it, sort of how I would analyze it sort of using MATLAB. Okay, so here's your symmetric laminate engineering properties uh, on the slides. Also note that we have this modulus Poisson relationship, just like you have for typical lamina. And you also have a relationship between the modulus and the shear coupling coefficients here and here. Okay, so these sorts of things develop with this particular matrix. All right, and so far we've only really talked about this particular setup for a symmetric laminate. All right, now it turns out that this relationship actually holds through non symmetric laminates. So if we looked at a more general condition, which would be sort of like this full blown case where there is no decoupling of the matrix through this idea of BIJ being zero, then we must assume that the general form holds here where we have no zero entries in like this B matrix or this lower left C matrix down here. And so we would again rock our similar like experiments where we just apply load in one direction and see what results. And in this situation, what results is a complication that involves sort of the coupling between the stress that we applied in X and maybe some curvatures that are developing um, because of the coupling between applied loads and curvatures. Okay. However, if you go through this whole process and you do the inversions and all of it shakes out, you end up with the same thing for your little a matrix. All right. So the relationship between the little a matrix and the laminate engineering properties is still the same. You get some funkiness that happens with the B, C, and D matrices, but that's a little bit beyond what we're trying to do in this class. Okay, so we've talked about a lot the last couple of weeks. I want to give you kind of like a problem-solving strategy that you might employ to uh, to work through some of these problems. Okay, so I've I've kind of put together this little flowchart here for you to think about how you might go from the most basic information, which is constituent properties, so properties of the matrix, properties of the fiber, all the way to what would be laminate engineering properties given certain pieces of information along the way. So what I mean is, let's say that you're given information about fiber and matrix, all right, and volume fraction, all right, so you're going to create a lamina that has a certain fiber in matrix modulus and a certain fiber in matrix Poisson's ratio, and then a certain volume fraction that results. Okay, so from that, you know that you can get the lamina engineering properties. Remember, you should have written a program that was like lamina props in your MATLAB. Um, that's what you're going to do for homework number two, is you're going to write a function that basically takes these and goes to these. All right, if you haven't done that already. Then once you've established the lamina properties, you can construct the in-plane stiffness matrix for that particular lamina Q. Right. So this is for one particular lamina. You know how to build that stiffness matrix Q. Now, let's say we want to create a laminate stack that is a stack of those lamina. OK, so if we have a stack of those lamina, we need a stacking sequence. OK, so here's your stacking sequence and that feeds in and can give you what is generally the in plane stiffness of this particular matrix for layer number K. OK, so layer K might be oriented at some angle theta. And so you can determine what the stiffness of that particular layer is at that particular portion of the lamina by incorporating the value of K. All right. Or the value of theta. Now we need to know information about where those lamina are located. OK, so what is the thickness of the lamina? Where is lamina number one, number two, number three, so on and so forth. And with that information, you construct your capital A, B and D matrices. OK, so for your homework, Problem two involves you writing functions that basically handle all of this stuff. Okay, so going from very basic fiber properties all the way up through calculating the A, B, and D matrices 
the laminate stiffness matrices. Okay. Once you have the laminate stiffness matrices, it's pretty easy to invert and get the laminate compliance matrices. Okay. So going from what would be this portion to this portion just revolves around an inversion in MATLAB. And then if you know the total laminate thickness, which is H, you can use this little A matrix with the things that we just talked about or derived before to get to your laminate engineering constants. Whew, man, who's tired? I'm tired. That's a lot. Imagine doing that by hand. That would be horrible. I would never, ever ask you to do that because that would be terrible. All right. So hopefully you kind of see and understand the need for using computational software at this point and why I'm sort of pushing you towards writing these functions in MATLAB, getting them going in MATLAB so that you can uh, sort of make things a lot easier for yourself. Okay. Going to do these repetitive calculations over and over and over. You might as well have a computer do it. All right. So I want to show an example here that sort of uses that idea. And here I'm reinforcing that you should be using computational software at this point uh, and where you might be using those particular functions. OK, so here I'm highlighting where those functions might generally be useful. All right. So I want to do a full example problem that looks at calculating laminate engineering properties from the baseline properties of the fibers in the matrix. OK, so here's an example problem that I'm going to run. This is from the alternate textbook in this class. This is from the Malik textbook, page 189. And I'll give you a second here if you sort of want to like write this down or copy this down. And then I'll show you the MATLAB code that I've used to sort of analyze this and we'll walk through it and kind of show sort of the results um, for this particular guy. So I want the laminate engineering properties of a 45 negative 45 symmetric. Okay, so that's this general structure made using T300 carbon fibers in an epoxy matrix with the following assumptions. So we're going to assume the volume fraction is constant at 60%. Each lamina is six millimeters thick, so each particular layer is six millimeters thick, which is really thick for a lamina, but let's roll with it. Uh, and then the constituents have the following properties, all right, that we have the various properties of the fibers and the matrix. So remember, carbon fibers are orthotropic, and so we have not only modulus in the one direction here, but modulus in the two direction, Poisson's ratio one to um, shear modulus one to of the fiber. Here's our matrix properties. Again, this is isotropic, so we just have one modulus and one Poisson's ratio prescribed. So this is what the laminate might sort of look like from above if you thought about like the stacking sequence being plus minus 45. And this is actually what the stacking sequence is kind of looking on it from the side. The Malik textbook likes using Z positive as downwards, but I don't like that, so I'm not doing that. Okay, so let's walk through this problem and some of the code that you might see in MATLAB. All right, so first things first is getting the important information. All right, so these first couple lines are just kind of uh, clearing everything out, making sure I'm, I'm working with a clean slate. Here I'm entering the properties of the fiber in the matrix. So this portion here is all entry of the information that was given to me. Here's the thickness of the laminate, and here's the stacking sequence uh, for this particular laminate, plus 45, minus 45 symmetric. So plus, minus, minus, plus, and then my volume fraction, 60%. <laughs> now I'm using the lamina properties function, which you will get to write, that takes information about the fiber and matrix properties and the fiber volume fraction and spits back to me the lamina properties, E1, E2, N12, and G12. So you did this for homework one, or you should have done this for homework one. So the code required in lamina properties function should be pretty straightforward for you at this point. Okay. So this is first things first, calculating the lamina properties. I'm just kind of like following this procedure. First thing first, calculate lamina properties. Next, I want to calculate the stiffness matrix and principal coordinates. Again, that's using this QMAT function with the inputs here being the lamina properties E1, E2, NU12, and G12. Okay, so you get to write that one too. Out oh, this guy pops. Calculating the ABD matrices. Okay, hopefully you've done this for homework number one. Um, or sorry for homework number two, you're working through this. Uh, and again, you need to write this function that calculates A, B, and D, and out they pop. All right, so you'll notice for this particular laminate that I have the B matrix equal to zero, and that just comes out from the calculation, but we know that to be true for symmetric laminates, which is one that we have here. All right, continuing. 
since we have a balanced symmetric laminate, we would expect this to be true, right? So Bij is zero, A16 equals A26 equals zero. And those two things we do see here with our solution of ABD, all right? One other thing I'll say is we also sort of have flavors of quasi-isotropic, since A11 is equal to A12, meaning that whether I pull it in the one direction or the two direction, I have the same response. So I have sort of a quasi-isotropic flavor here, though it's not truly quasi-isotropic, all right? So we'll continue here with some new material, and that is inverting the ABBD matrices to get the little a matrix. So what I'm doing here is I'm putting together my full six by six stiffness matrix. I'm inverting that to get my full six by six compliance matrix. And then I pull the little a matrix as the first three rows, first three columns of this six by six. Okay. One other method you could employ is since you have a symmetric laminate, A and D matrices are T coupled and you could invert A directly. So whether you do it this full way where you create the six by six and invert, or you just invert the three by three A matrix itself, you should get the same answer. And we do see that here. All right. Finally, we're going to use sort of the relationships between the entries of the little A matrix and sort of these laminate engineering problem properties we talked about today to sort of come up with the full born slate of limited engineering properties dependent on the thickness of the laminate. Okay, so that is like this variable H, which is the thickness of one lamina times the total number of layers that we have, where TH here is my lamina stacking sequence. So here, these are these variables that are sort of being plucked out of that little A matrix to define things like my modules in the X direction, my Poisson's ratio, X, Y, so on and so on and so on. Okay, so if we do that, here's our resulting information. And you'll see here that the elastic modulus in X matches the elastic modulus in Y, which is something that we would expect from a laminate that's like plus minus 45. All right. Some of these other constants sort of shake out as well. You'll see that there's no shear coupling coefficients here um, for any of the orientations, which is kind of an interesting thing about this particular laminate. All right. One last thing I wanted to do, and one that thing that's nice to do about writing these functions is that you can quickly change certain things and see what happens. So if I want to relate this laminate that, that I created to, let's say, the same laminate made out of glass and epoxy instead of carbon and epoxy, I could do that. Or if I was interested in changing the stacking sequence to 0, 90, 90, 0, I could look at what happens there, so on and so forth. So I can quickly cycle through a variety of different composites to determine, all right, if I change this, if I change this, if I change that, how does my effective modulus in these various directions change? Okay. So if we look at a similar composite, carbon fiber epoxy, made with a stacking sequence of 0, 090 symmetric, how does it compare? Okay, well, here was our original that I just did on the previous couple slides. And how does that compare to a carbon fiber epoxy that's 0, 090, 90, 0? Okay, well, here we see some interesting things. And again, that the modulus in the X and the modulus in the Y is the same, okay, because we have sort of this quasi-isotropic sort of flavor, but you'll notice that it is much higher. And that is because now, instead of the fibers being aligned 45 degrees with our direction of loading, now we have sort of this orientation where at least some of the layers are fully aligned with our direction of loading, all right? Which is kind of a nice little thing. And we can also compare it to what things look like with a glass fiber and epoxy. And you'll see that, let's say the modulus in X here and the modulus in Y for the glass is lower than the modulus that we have for the carbon fiber material, which is something you might expect, all right? So um, that's kind of uh, it for today. I'll say that I did one little example here where we looked at a variety of different um, composites, but there are graphs in your book that show how the effective stiffness, the effective Poisson's ratio, the uh, shear coupling coefficients, so on and so forth, vary with the orientation of the laminate. Okay, so these graphs I took from your book, and you might want to think about here in this upper left-hand corner, this is the elastic modulus, um, the effective elastic modulus of the laminate EX. Uh, and so we'd see things like if it's quasi-isotropic, regardless of the orientation of loading with respect to that laminate, my effective stiffness is constant. However, as I rotate and change the orientation of my laminate with respect to uh, the loading direction for, let's say, an angle ply laminate or, let's say, a unidirectional laminate, we might have different responses. So a graph like this might help you 
understand what stacking sequence and what orientation you might have to have for your laminate to give you the engineering properties that you sort of want. Okay. So, um, what about on the test? Asked Dan Scully. Uh, so we'll talk about the test another time. There's more to say about the test than I can cover in 30 seconds. But anyway, uh, that's it for today. Uh, I hope you ha guys uh, feel ready that you can do homework number two. You should be ready to do all the problems. Um, so thanks for coming. Uh, I'll stick around for questions. Um, and remember, your homework's due at the beginning on Monday. Okay.